Well, good morning. It is good to be here and to be with you on Election Day. I'm sure that that's the, you know, that's not even on your mind, uh, Election Day, unless you're a Calvinist, then it's always on your mind. And, uh, but I am glad that you are here. I'm guessing we have a multi-denominational gathering here. Um, I hope. I like to talk to multi-denominational. Any Anglicans here? Can to raise your hand if you're an Anglican? I see, oh, praise God, several Anglicans, good. Any, any, uh, any Presbyterians? Yeah, oh, a few of those. Any charismatic Pentecostals? Raise both hands. There you go. Used to that. I appreciate that. Baptists? Oh, yeah. Wow. I, I've heard of them. Um, okay, well, good. And, and anyone in a cult or a sect that they'd like to share? No. Um, well, it's good to be here, and I know I missed a lot of you, but we are going to talk about uh, Mr. Graham. And by the way, you'll notice we, people use different, some people call him Billy Graham, some people call him Dr. Graham, but inside sort of the Graham organization, they use Mr. Graham, and so we sort of reflect that at the Billy Graham Center. But let me tell you a little bit about who I am not before we start to talk about some things about Mr. Graham. Uh, I'm a missiologist and a pastor. My PhD is in missiology, so I, I, uh, I'm not an historian of Billy Graham. Uh, if anything, I, I'm happy to tell you about how Boniface cut down the sacred oak of Thor in the evangelization of the Frisians, and later were martyred by the Frisians. Um, so that's my field, and we, if you want to talk about Willingen and the majority and minority report there, I can talk about conciliar missions all day. Uh, but for me, um, I'm not a Billy Graham historian, but I want to tell you something about a story, um, carefully avoiding some of the topics of others, because you have some of the world's leading Billy Graham scholars actually here right now in this room. This speaking here kind of reminds me a little bit about the voice in reverse. So if I say something wrong, I know Bill Martin can hit his buzzer and turn around and I'm out. And so I don't want to... I don't want to mess anything up. Also, this is chapel for uh, Truett, and I want to make sure that we are a bit more chapel-esque in the presentation, so it's not just simply, uh, not there's anything wrong with this, but not just me simply reading a paper, but trying to draw some implications. I'm not going to preach through a text. I normally do that. I'm the uh, interim preacher right now, interim teaching pastor at a church in Chicago called the Moody Church, and so I, I preach there each and every week, and it does remind me that one of the passions of my life that you will come through and what we talk about is the passion of evangelism. Um, and I'll talk about that today and tie that into our conversation today. You see, I work every week, every day I sit in an office at the Billy Graham Center. I'm in the Wilson Suite, which will mean something to some of you. I go by Barrow's Auditorium to get to the Wilson Suite. And I ask my staff during our staff meetings, who have you shared the gospel with this week? And then I go preach every Sunday at Moody Church in downtown Chicago, which is named also after an evangelist. And we ask one another, how have we shared the gospel this week? Here's why. Uh, in the both of the places I work, we should either change our name or change our ways and be more engaged intentionally in evangelism. You will see that here. Furthermore, my role is not to bring you a critical historical look. Others will do that, and I think that's certainly appropriate. But on this, uh, Mr. Graham's 100th birthday is tomorrow. Uh, we'll actually celebrate that also at the Billy Graham Center, which is why I'm today and regrettably won't be here tomorrow. I would love to be here, but, uh, but we have our own celebration there for his 100th birthday as well. So enough, be enough being said about that. Let me tell you a little bit of the journey, how I kind of connected here, and then we'll spend most of the time focusing on Mr. Graham. Uh, when I first took this job, I got this card here. Um, and it's, it's a secret card. It actually has um, a series of numbers and code words on it. It's very strange. And they told me I need to have this on me at all times. And uh, because when some world-shaping event happened, presidents would change their schedules, uh, news networks would all go live, that I would have advance notice if I used this card and I followed the protocol. And so I was, uh, I was actually going to this place to speak at a group called One Hope. It's kind of a charismatic group that does uh, real, real relief work. And so going to Florida, Donna, my wife, was going with me because anytime, when you live in Chicago, anytime there's Florida involved, Donna wants to come. And so she's a wise woman. So we were, yeah, we actually got in our Uber in the western suburbs of Chicago. I live in Chicago. And we got in our Uber and we started making our trek to O'Hare. And it's about a 40 minute drive. And as we got in the car, you know, the Uber driver started talking to us. Our Uber driver was not the typical Uber driver in the western suburbs of Chicago uh, in that, you know, we're a much more diverse area than many places in the country and Uber drivers have probably, in my experience, have been majority from minority cultures, contexts, often internationals. Here, it was this middle-aged Anglo woman. And so we got in the car and she introduced herself as Jane and we started to drive to the airport. She, when we came in, she said, if you need a phone charger, I got a phone charger, grab anything you want in the middle. There was some candy, some water, and quite clearly, a Bible. And the Bible was not a Gideon Bible, but it kind of looked like one of those little green Gideon Bibles. And, and so Donna kind of smiled at me because we knew she was saying, you could take the Bible. So, and so I kind of winked at Donna and we started to drive and Jane started a conversation, very appropriate conversation. Well, 
you know, what brought you to town? I told we lived here two years, what brought you to town? I said, well, I'm a teacher. And I quickly changed up. I said, well, what do you do? And, and she said, well, I'm a realtor. And my kids encouraged me in the free time to kind of drive this uh, Uber. And so we got to talking and Jane was slowly and surely moving the conversation to spiritual things. And so we're about halfway through the trip, maybe 20 minutes in, and Jane says to me, so I mean, do you guys like, like, have any spiritual beliefs? Have you ever thought about spiritual beliefs or anything like that? And so at this point, Donna turns to me and says, you have to tell her. Um, and so I'm like, okay. So and I hadn't lied. I, mean, I told her I was a teacher. I am a teacher. I teach evangelism, but I am a teacher. Uh, and so we were 20 minutes in. She says, you guys th- thought about spiritual things? And so I said, Jane, Jane, I just... Just so you know, so I'm like, I hold the Billy Graham chair at Wheaton College. I'm a professor of evangelism and missions. I, didn't, I don't think I said mission. I'm a professor of evangelism, and you are doing a great job today. Um, and she laughed, and I actually uh, record, recorded this with her, um, uh, an interview with her as well. And I, I titled it, and it got picked up by Christianity Today, and then Breakpoint This Week, and then all these other places. It's just called Jane the Uber Driver. You see, Jane, the Uber driver, was doing something that was significant. She was seeking to share the gospel. She took us to the airport, and we flew down to uh, Florida, West Palm Beach. Had, uh, it was uh, getting up to go speak to this group, and I actually had the card, but I put the card uh, outside the shower, and I got, uh, while well, I was in the shower, the phone rang, and I, I didn't have any reason to know specifically that it was this, so I missed the call, but I, when I got out, I saw it was from the number, that the code would then be activated. And they call, I called back and they said two words to me. They said the wash, well, two, two words with a, with a beginning, the Washington Project. The Washington Project is the secret code word that was used. I would then took the phone, I called five people on the list, all the phone numbers are listed here on the back, and I said the Washington Project. And before it was public, we began to replan our schedules, right? So I, I had a series of articles that I were gonna, gonna release at CNN and USA Today. We set up a studio TV and a radio studio. Uh, there in the hotel uh, about an hour before it became public. You see, Washington Project was the code that Mr. Graham had died. And so at that point, things began to change. Now again, um, that was the secret code. And one thing you should learn from this conversation is don't tell Ed Stetzer secrets. That's one thing you should probably learn. But it's not a secret so much anymore, obviously. So, So what we did is begin to talk about the life of Mr. Graham. And so, so what I want to say to you is what my focus is, my focus talking to you today, is not uh, the specific details of Mr. Graham's life. Others will talk about that. But instead, I, 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 my focus, I actually teach people not about Billy Graham, but, but about what Billy Graham did and how we can do the same. And not so much who he was in every step, though who he was relates to that. And I want to base my talk around a series of, of some things he did. And I, in a CNN um, article, uh, I, I wrote some about Mr. Graham in the CNN article. Here's what I wrote. Uh, in fact, when someone commented to Graham that he had done some great things, his response was, God had done some good things through me. At the heart of the vision was the simple belief that the gospel of Jesus Christ was the needed answer for a struggling world. Now, uh, I wrote that because I wanted to remind people, and, and CNN, I asked CNN, how, how explicit can I be? And they said, just go all in. This is Billy Graham. You can do the whole deal. And I, and I did, and shared the fullness of it. So he, but his, his humility, which you can actually hear a little bit later in one of the presentations, his humility was evident. God has done some good things through me. Now, I think it's a key thing right now, and I I think it is in some ways appropriate that this is election day. Uh, It's interesting because some of the things Mr. Graham did was to speak up on issues of his day. We're aware of when he took down the ropes between the segregated crusade. Uh, We're also aware that he took sometimes controversial stance, but that was not the deriving force of his ministry. We'll address that, but it was certainly part of his ministry. And on election day, it does remind us that I, for one, wish for an evangelicalism that looked a little bit more like Billy Graham today and a little less like some of the more strident verses that are out, voices that are out there. So let's take a look at some things. Let's start with some background, right? Billy Graham said, said, said uh, God did some things, but let's take it some background. Now, for some of you, uh, Billy Graham is a new name. Now, we, you know, we have the Billy Graham Center on the campus of our school, and I will tell you the most common question people ask is, who is Billy Graham when the students come? Uh, 18 year olds do not know who uh, Billy Graham is and we often ask them to de-enroll and go to another school if they don't. Um, we don't send them to Baylor because you would reject them as well. So, but, but to not know, but it's, it's just a reality. And partly because people don't realize how old Billy Graham was. Now, I know 100 seems like an old number. It is an old number. But you know, Billy Graham, it was over 70 years ago that Billy Graham was a student at Wheaton College. It was over 70 years ago that Ruth Bell Graham lived in the, the same dorm as my daughter, who's a student at Wheaton College. She lived in the same room that she lived in. I told her, that's fine, but you're not allowed to date anybody who's going into the ministry. That's kind of a family rule. 
uh, just for her benefit and the good of all. Um, but, but it's been a long, long time. So Mr. Graham hasn't been engaged in wide public ministry since 2005. And so when you see, I was at the, I was at the house last year and uh, it had been uh, in Montreal, it had been uh, years and years and years since anyone had seen him publicly, maybe an occasional picture of somebody coming in. Um, but what about him? We grew up in a dairy farm in North Carolina. You'll know if you go to the Billy Graham Library, it's a little confusing just the geography here. So the Billy Graham Museum is actually at Wheaton College. The Billy Graham Library is actually in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now the library actually has no books, so it's a little confusing. So, uh, and we're, at our place we have books, but they have much more museum space than we have. So it's just, it has to do with the order in which they were built. And they are two separate distinct organizations. So I don't work for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I work for the trustees of Wheaton College and through a subboard we have for the Billy Graham Center. But uh, Graham was known early on, spent time reading uh, books as a young boy, go up into the hayloft to do that. He came, he came to Christ at 16, and it's interesting because if you go to the Billy Graham Library, that's the one in Charlotte, they actually have the little Bible where he wrote his commitment to Christ, which is interesting because he wrote, he rededicated his life on that day. And so it's interesting. He didn't say he committed, he says he rededicated his life that day. And it was asked at one point what that meant. Well, he grew up in an ARP, Associated Reformed Presbyterian, home that where his parents would have uh, baptized him and seeing that as an entrance into a covenant that he later would need to engage. And when I listened to him preach his sermons at Buffalo, New York, where I was a church planter in 1988, he would get up and say, you can trust Christ or renew your confirmation vows, which was a controversial thing for him to say because it gave space and place for people who might not be in the evangelical tradition, Catholics in particular, to come. But that's what Buffalo actually was, remarkably Catholic. He attended something called the Florida Bible Institute. It's now called Trinity College of Florida from 37 to 40 and studied scripture. It was unaccredited. I'm going to explain why that's important in just a minute. It's accredited now. It's a fine school now. Uh, he married uh, Ruth Bell in Montreat, North Carolina on August 13th, 1943. And it's interesting, we want to look at the lessons at some of these uh, some things, some background, some good things. Uh, you know, God had a plan for his life and intervened at times for that, which kind of leads to number two, um, some benefactors. He had, he had, he had, he had some, we gave him some background, he had some benefactors. And this is a key thing for some of the great leaders in ministry of our day is somebody supports what God has called them to do and in some ways to do it together. So the story goes like this. Actually, tomorrow morning, I'll talk to a thousand church planters in Chicagoland uh, to talk a little bit about Billy Graham's birthday. I won't tell them that I'm going to talk about that because my event is in the evening, but I will go to this event with, a, you know, church planter types are all very hyped up on Mountain Dew and uh, ready to go change the world for Jesus. And so I will, um, I will actually show them a picture of an old man named Elner Edmund which a few people over here know who they are, but and it's kind of it's no fun for you people being here because it's like everything I say, you're like, oh, that's an awesome story. And the rest of them don't know the story, but you're already having fun with the story in your head. So stop it. Um, so Elmer Edmund is, uh, is a name you wouldn't know. He's a Chicago businessman. A guy named Paul Fisher was with him. Uh, and they were uh, going down to play golf. And one of the things that a lot of times would take place is that students would actually be caddies for, for these... Um, for, for a businessman to come down and help support their way through school. And, uh, and so, um, so they were working with this young man who's Mr. Graham, Billy Graham, and he's doing the caddy, he invites him to go preach, they go hear him preach and they're impressed. And they say to him that, listen, you, you can't, I mean, God's got, in a sense, God's got his hand on you. Uh, God's got a plan for you. Uh, you can't, God's got partners for you. You can't do what God's gonna call you to do with an unaccredited Bible degree from a, a, an unaccredited Bible college. And so he says that he can't afford it. And so they say, well, we're, we'll put together some scholarships. And he agrees to come, and he comes to Wheaton College to be a student. Elner Edmund is the brother of the Wheaton College president, uh, President Edmund, who's the chapel's named after him. And Paul Fisher was the chairman of the Board of Trustees at Wheaton at the time. So he goes there. What happens is he's you know three years of school, and it, much to his shock, he doesn't get three years of credit. He starts way back, and he was a little bothered by that, but then he becomes um, an anthropology major, and it's true, he is the most famous anthropology major ever in the history of the world. So <laughs> just remember, not for anthropology, but he is the most famous anthropology major ever, which is probably a reminder to you who are students is that, if you think of your undergrad student, what you major in is probably not what you're gonna end up doing long term. I will tell you my biology and chemistry degree is going wonderfully well uh, right now as I train pastors and missionaries. Um, and so, so he had some benefactors. And those benefactors remained and were a key part 
if there's a book called Gospel Patron that sort of walks through some examples of that for the sake of time, uh, I won't. N number three, remember he said God did some things through me. Let me tell you about some ministry he did, right, some ministry. Um, one of the things that people often say is that Billy Graham's first church was Western Springs Baptist Church in the suburbs of, uh, Western suburbs of Chicago. And it's actually not true, but it's, it's somewhat true. It's, it's his first full-time pastorate. Uh, but if you walk down my street where I live, two blocks from my house, there's a, uh, there's a Masonic Hall. And inside that Masonic Hall, there was a church that met there. And for two years, uh, it was at the United Gospel Tabernacle. He was the teacher, what we'd call a teaching pastor today. He was the teaching pastor in this Masonic Hall, which would later lead to some great conspiracy theories on websites. Um, he was a pastor of the Tabernacle from September 41 till 43 while he was a full-time student at Wheaton College. And, and then, of course, he would go on to a church called Western Springs, which is now called the Village Church, and that was the first uh, and only full-time pastor he held, and their basement today is basically a shrine to Billy Graham. Now, Billy Graham's influence in our community is pretty significant. I actually was yesterday, I was, I knew your chapel was too fancy to have a projection. I know there's an option, but it looks too, too fancy. I preached at, uh, I preached at uh, uh, Beeson Divinity School last week, and they, they kind of, when I said, do you have projection? They said, in other words, no, you Philistine. Um, so, but I went to vote yesterday because I'm not here, and you can't see this, but if it was projection, can you see that? Uh, you'd actually see, when you go through the DuPage County offices, which is where I voted yesterday, there's actually a whole section to Billy Graham. Now, DuPage County is not a distinctly more, I mean, Wheaton is a bit of an evangelical bubble, but DuPage County is not. But he's the most famous person who ever lived in DuPage County. So the size of the impact is hard for some people to understand. Some things just quickly we'll go through. He was ordained as a Southern Baptist minister uh, by uh, the St. John's River Association at uh, Pinal Baptist Church. Uh, it's a little strange. We don't do it through associations as much anymore, but back then associations were much more involved, almost in a Presbyterian like way. He was the first staff member of uh, Youth for Christ uh, and eventually became its vice president. First, first staff member became the president of Northwestern Schools. I do, I have a national radio program I just did from there Saturday and uh, still thriving. Northwestern, it's called uh, University at Northwestern now. And so, so he, he was known for some significant ministry before he ultimately became this global leader that we would know. Number, number four, right, is some boundaries. Something he'll be known about that so most people find controversy to, controversial today, but Graham, Barrow, Shea, and Grady Wilson met together in a uh, motel during a campaign in Modesto, California. And they prepared uh, what was originally a joke, but it was, they called it the Modesto Manifesto. This is one of the things that, um, that is remarkably resilient in its staying power. And it's not without controversy today. It came up most recently with uh, the Mike Pence rule. Mike Pence follows the the Billy Graham rule, but, but I will tell you that though people talk about it less because it's become less common, uh, you will find that this rule is widely held. I was, uh, I preached at Saddleback in March and went to lunch with uh, the Warrens, Don, we're friends for years, and Donna and I and Kay and Rick went to lunch, and we were talking a little bit about the, the to be honest, the Bill Hybels um, scandal. And um, what very clear was articulated, anybody at Saddleback who doesn't follow the Billy Graham rule would be fired. And so, so very clearly, this is a very widespread. So what was that? Well, first of all, it's more than just one thing. It's more than just what it's been reduced down to. But here's a few of what it is. It was that ethical handling of money uh, had to be seen as ethical, local committee handling of finances. Um, and eventually, soon after that, would abolish love offerings at their crusades. Sexual temptation, they, they resolved to avoid uh, not only sin, but any situation might be construed uh, as sinful. He was never to be left alone with a woman, not his wife. Uh, they avoided exaggeration or false publicity about their crowds, um, and, uh, and they were very concerned about verifiable statistics. Number four, criticism of local pastors. Uh, before him, someone like a preacher like Billy Sunday would often attack local churches. And, uh, and so, here's, so here's what's interesting, too, what a lot of people don't know. If you've heard about that, you probably have, just because it's become controversial in some circles. And I would exhort those who followed the Billy Graham rule to, to seek to make ways to account to, to, to find ways to include and involve uh, women leaders and more. You know, at Lifeway, where I served before, uh, we had a variant of the Billy Graham rule, and the way we did it is I, I, I created a, a mentoring group that 
uh, of women that we work together through to give them opportunities within the organization because just to be blunt, evangelical organizations are not the best places for women to have opportunities. And the Billy Graham rule can become a downward force on women's opportunity if you don't work in, through, and around that reality. And others can debate that more, but that's a very defining thing that comes out of that conversation. What a lot of people don't know is that the Modesto Manifesto actually was in response to Amy Simple McPherson, who uh, was actually a well-known evangelist just down the road um, and so, just fun fact, um, so, the big, so the Modesto Manifesto came from there, and the biggest opponent to um, Amy Simple McPherson was the pastor of Moody Church when Amy Simple McPherson uh, kind of rose to prominence. And she's a very controversial character. There's a PBS special called Sister Amy, it's worth watching. Um, <laughs> but you would know the denomination today. If no one else, you'd know who Jack Hayford is. Um, and so he's Pentecostalism's gold standard Christianity today, talked about. So I spoke at the Foursquare meeting this past uh, year in Seattle, their annual meeting. And so knowing that I hold the Billy Graham chair and I'm preaching in D.L. Moody's church, I actually brought a, the letter that the pastor of Moody Church said to rebuke and say that nothing that could come out of this ministry would bear fruit. And I kind of read a little bit of it and I said, hey, I'm sorry about that, we don't think that anymore. Uh, and because the Foursquare is obviously, a, a th I'm very thankful for the gospel work that the Foursquare is doing, 80,000 churches around the world. So number five, just talk about some turning points, some turning points. Um, the, the, uh, for me, I, I do tours through the museum, usually groups of pastors. So we have a uh, rural ministry cohort called the Rural uh, Matters Initiative at, at uh, the Billy Graham Center has a series of, of, uh, of outward focusing ministries. And one of them is the Rural Matters Institute. So I was taking the rural pastors through, but yeah, I've done this probably a hundred times. I meet groups of pastors, 10 at a time, take them through the museum. Um, and if you've come to Wheaton College, you know, come by and do that. We'd love to, to have you do that. Come to our Amplify conference this summer and we do the tours there. Uh, as well, it's now the largest evangelism conference meeting annual in the country. So, um, but I take them through and I sort of know um, now the things to point out. And I try to have a little fun and say, here's something you maybe didn't know. Here's something you, you know, because there's some things that are not, sorry, in the history. Um, so, but there's one place that I always kind of get stopped and sometimes choked up a little. And I don't know why. Something eventually, after a while, you should stop being choked up by something. I told this as a well-known preacher in my denomination named David Platt, and he cries every time he speaks. And I've never seen him preach without crying. And, uh, and so I told him, David, I mean, at some point you have to get over this. At some point you have to stop crying at every sermon. The difference, he genuinely weeps because he wants to see the nations hear the news of the gospel, which is why I love to listen to his heart and his passion. Um, so some things just can wreck you for, and so when I go here, this is so right, if you, you can't see, but I kind of come around the corner, here's Western, Western Springs Baptist Church, that's the one church he pastored full time, and then it's Northwestern, the college here, and then it goes to um, Modesto Manifesto right there, and then next to it, it's not listed, but what happened after, soon after that was the Altoona Crusade campaign. The Altoona campaign was considered a flop, um, uh, their worst, most disappointing meeting, and uh, Grady Wilson called it the sorriest crusade we ever had. Billy was ready to give up the ministry after Altoona. Uh, now, now, there were also other important things that were going on there as well. So he kind of comes, uh, comes out of this crusade having seen it as a failure. And also there are things going on in his own spiritual life as well. Uh, one of his good friends connected to the Youth for Christ named Templeton had um, uh, one of the more famous incidents in his life, had sort of walked away uh, for different levels and over time different levels, but it just walked away from seeing the Bible the same way and eventually walking away more and more agnosticism and ultimately Bill uh, Lee Strobel did a beautiful interview with him just a couple of years ago that that, uh, that was very very moving so he had a friend who sort of said you know Billy don't believe all these things and so then he comes there's this one moment it's kind of this uh, this stump they call it so Charles Templeton walks away uh, he's sh kind of shook I mean Graham shook he's he, this, this really you know bombed crusade friends walking away from the faith and then he tells the story he and Graham actually recounts this He's walking through the woods at a retreat center in San Bernardino Mountains, stopped and fell on his knees, putting the Bible on the tree stump in front of him. I'm actually reading from the article he wrote. Uh, and launched into a prayer that, um, that would define his life and ministry. Actually, I think Will wrote this. And he came to the conclusion he was going to just believe God's word. Um, and in doing so, uh, he totally, he used this word later, he totally surrendered himself to, I'm not going to understand everything. I'm going to believe it in its totality. Uh, and, and, and again, he was a very thoughtful person. Don't, don't think of Billy Graham as a simpleton at all. Um, but he went through that moment 
And in the middle of doing so, right, because, you know, uh, Templeton had said to him, Billy, you're 50 years out of date. People no longer accept the Bible as being inspired the way you do. Your faith is too simple, unquote. So, so here's what Graham said. He said, I had no doubt concerning the deity of Jesus Christ or the validity of the gospel, uh, unquote. This is later from his biography, Just As I Am, the song we just sang. But was the Bible completely true? With Los Angeles campaign galloping toward me, I had to answer, if I could not trust the Bible, I could not go on. I would have to quit the school presidency. I'd have to leave pulpit evangelism. He went for a walk and he came to a tree stump. And after a period of prayer, he took his uh, Bible and he says this, quote, I sensed the presence and power of God as I had not sensed it months. Not only my questions, not all my questions were answered, but I knew a spiritual battle in my soul had been fought and won. And he put the Bible in stump. And from that point um, said, I'm going to believe and, and when he preached and taught, he would say that I, when I preach and teach, I believe this is the, the, just God's word, God's very word. Um, now, what, if you're walking through the tour with me, what's right next to that is the tent. And people want to go right from the stump to the tent. And they just want to go right from the northwestern to the tent. And I, I try to stop and slow him down because right on the other side of the tent is one of the actual pulpits that he used. And everyone wants to go take a picture in front of them in the pulpit, right? Go up there, you know, point like Billy Graham would point. And I said, just wait just a minute. Because, and it's actually in the, the new book I just wrote. I, I use Billy Graham as an example. My, my new book just out, I guess less than a month ago, is called Christians in the Age of Outrage. Uh, bringing our best when the world's at its worst. You may have noticed a lot of people are kind of mad right now. Uh, maybe today might be a good day. A lot of people have been discipled by their cable news choices and spiritually shaped by their social media feed and they're angry. And I use Graham as an example, but part of it was he came to the place where he was going to surrender himself to what God was doing. And so, so some of you went to the uh, funeral uh, at Charlotte, um, and, and it was, uh, if, if you didn't go to the funeral and you listened on the radio, I was the voice, I was the guy on the radio talking. Because you can't listen to a funeral because everyone moves slowly with things. So we'd sort of fill in the color commentary that was there, which is very weird. I've never done color commentary on anything, let alone a funeral. Uh, but my team put together a great list of things. So, you know, here's so-and-so, they're coming. But you might have watched it on television. Uh, some called it Mr. Graham's Last Crusade. But the, the thing is, um, the tent at the funeral is, was a reproduction of the tent in Los Angeles. And the tent in Los Angeles changes everything, right? So what happens is, is he, he gets there, he gets to now, I mean, he's already had some national publicity, but now it sort of takes off from there, right? And, and uh, there's a William Randolph Hearst, kind of, and there's a famous phrase, Puff Graham, but basically already positive coverage, but now an even greater positive coverage, and soon his ministry takes off. But here's what I, what I say to, to pastors that I walk through this. I say, listen, a lot of people want to get to the tent, but they don't want to go through the stump. And for all of us, there comes a time of spiritual struggle. It might be that St. John of the Cross moment, that dark cloud of unknowing, that place in that time when we say, dear Jesus, I don't get it all, I don't know it all, but to you I give it all. And then and subsequently, the Lord blesses, sometimes in powerful ways like a tent, and sometimes just in the continued faithfulness of long obedience in the same direction. To quote, of course, Eugene Peterson. So let's go to number five on our outline, some crusades. You might have heard he did some crusades. He did something, God did some things through him, he did some crusades. Um, preached the gospel to more people in live audiences than anyone else in history. Um, it's interesting, we've actually different numbers. Um, the BGA went with 215 million people in more than 185 countries and territories. I will tell you, um, that's where I got to know Billy Graham. So, um, I participate in his ministry. So I was 21 years old. Donna and I felt the call of God to plant a church in the inner city of Buffalo, New York. So we moved to the inner city, planted a church among the urban poor, a uh, multicultural church that uh, still, still is there today. It's predominantly a uh, Burmese congregation today. It's in, a very, it's in a neighborhood you would intentionally avoid unless the Lord had called you there. But what happened was, um, I guess it was 31 years ago, um, we moved there and uh, Billy Graham was having a crusade in Pilot Field, it was called at the time, in downtown Buffalo kind of a triple-A ball stadium. Um, and so we tried to participate, and they said no. I said, can I participate? They said, no, no, you're not, a, you're not a church. Well, it's true. We were just two people. We were starting a church. We were a church plant. We were affiliated with our denomination, but I was turned down by the home mission board of my denomination to be a church planter, so I got a job. I was blowing insulation, doing contracting and renovation, built some homes over the course of my contractor career. Then I would go to seminary on the weekend, driving to Pittsburgh four hours each way, and then I would pastor this church called Calvary Christian Church. We started in the inner city of Buffalo among the urban poor. And so I went to them and they said, you're not even a church yet. We weren't. We had just showed up. And, and so I, I begged them. I kept coming back. I was like the, the begging the unjust judge. I said, listen, you have no churches 
near, in this area where I was, about 30,000 people, no churches that are engaged in the Billy Graham crusade with you. All I'm saying is don't throw those names away. Give them to me. And finally, I kept coming to the meetings and there was no restraining order put on me. And so, um, so finally I got the names and we planted a church from that. So the first three families that were part of the church that my first church plant actually came from there. Largest crusade was in Seoul, but someone's doing a whole presentation on that, so I'm not going to jump in on that. But he also did a crusade in Wheaton, which a lot of people don't know about. He actually did a crusade literally in the parking lot and spread into the streets in and around Wheaton. Here's what he said. But as I stand here this morning looking toward Blanchard, which is kind of the castle in the middle of our campus, I think of the classes I took in that building 40 years ago, the times I walked up and down those stairs. I looked toward Williston to my right. I remember I was there when I first met Ruth and immediately fell in love. It took her a year. The first date we had was Sunday before Christmas, 1940. Goes on, said, here at Wheaton, I received a new spiritual challenge and and an and, and intellectual perspective that influenced my ministry for more than 35 years. I said nice things about Wheaton as well. But those crusades became the defining thing of his ministry. Let me tell you about some presidents. God did some things through him. Well, it wasn't until Billy uh, Graham, Mr. Graham interacted with President Eisenhower that his role to the pastor of presidents kind of became best known. Um, Eisenhower spoke, allegedly said to him, I think one of the reasons I was elected was to help lead this country spiritually. Uh, he went on to say, we need a spiritual renewal. And, uh, and in Just As I Am, Billy Graham's book, he talks about uh, meeting Eisenhower. It says, as my scheduled 20 minutes near the, later in his life, months before his passing, as the scheduled 20 minutes with him extended to 30, he asked the doctor and nurses to leave us. Propped up on pillows against intravenous tubes, he took my hand and looked in my eyes, Billy, You've told me how to be sure my sins are forgiven, that I'm going to heaven. Would you tell me again? Billy writes, I took out my New Testament and read to him the familiar gospel verses, the precious promise of God about eternal life. Then my hand, still in his, I prayed briefly. Thank you, he said. I'm ready. Now, he had a close relationship with many U.S. presidents, but not all of them liked him. It's sometimes assumed that everybody uh, liked him. He was an invited guest at the inauguration of Eisenhower, participated in, in Johnson, Tr Nixon, Reagan, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, and Bill Clinton. But Truman didn't like him so much, and others will share about that. He was close, a little, not as much contact with, with uh, Carter and Obama, but very strong and friendly with Johnson and Reagan, and a strong relationship with Nixon that actually uh, wasn't just in and around the presidency, and later caused difficulty when tapes were released in a casual moment where Mr. Graham said some pretty horrible anti-Semitic things. You may have seen some of those things. We actually, at the Billy Graham Center, we held some time of prayer for our Jewish friends and neighbors after the shooting, and we received significant pushback that we would pray for this from somebody, to use one Twitter handle uh, comment, who is a known anti-Semite. One of the things that uh, Mr. Graham clearly did was apologize, and that apology was received by leaders of the Jewish community because of the work he had done for so long. Number eight, let's talk about some focus. Uh, he was deeply focused on gospel proclamation. Now, mind you, there were times when he deviated from that in ways that didn't make sense of his clear focus. But let me just start with what I think is the, tr the true thing, and then we'll talk about the deviations from it. Um, you, maybe you've heard the, the phrase, um, people put it on Facebook or Twitter, uh, St. Francis of Assisi. It says, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Have you heard or seen that before? Yeah, yeah. There's two problems with it. Number one, he never said it, so there's that. Um, 100 years after he, was, he died, it was quoted to, uh, attributed to him. He remember the words of Abraham Lincoln, don't believe all those quotes attributed to me on the internet. Uh, and, uh, and, so, but, and he wouldn't have said it, he was in a preaching order. But number two, it's really bad theology. Um, and ultimately, we've kind of fallen on a time, though, where people find themselves drawn to that. And Billy Graham would have said, no, stop. Proclamation of the gospel is essential normative part of the life of the Christian and the life of the church. And I think that's really essential because right now we kind of live in a time where Christians love evangelism as long as somebody else is doing it. Um, many of you have uh, raised your hand, probably most of you here were Baptists, and some of you may know that I was the, one of my roles, I was the statistician of the denomination um, for, uh, for about 10 years. And I, 10 years ago, I said 2007, I spoke at the Southern Baptist Convention, recognizing there's all different iterations of that in states and elsewhere. And I stood around and I said, this convention is losing its evangelistic passion. I said, look around. I said, this is the only place, I said, look around all the gray hair. This is the only place I feel, I go where I feel young and thin. And um, 
people laughed a little louder than that, but they, uh, then they realized, hey, but my passion has been to try to turn that around, uh, first in my denomination and now in evangelicalism as a whole. Now what's interesting is, is he seemed to have this focus and gospel proclamation is very clear. So as, we, as you even go through the museum, uh, the Billy Graham section is like intentionally bookended almost in an awkward way with redundancies. As you walk in, it says, for God so loved the world. This is, you, you're, there's the history of evangelism up to Graham. So it goes all the way back to the first Bible printed in Algonquin. The first Bible printed in America is in the Algonquin language. And it goes to the first Great, great Awakening, second Great Awakening, goes to the temperance movement, goes to D.L. Moody, comes out to Billy Sunday, and then finally you see Billy Graham. But then it's this huge cross. It's this huge cross art, and it's got verses. And it's like, oh, you stop. Don't think about Billy Graham as you go into the Billy Graham section. Think about Jesus. And the last thing you see is flutter eyes fixed upon Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Then you go into the Billy Graham section. Then you go out the Billy, you go through the Billy Graham section, you go out the Billy Graham section, and it's a huge cross. And it's a painting of a huge cross. And not only in case you miss it, you then have to literally leave the Billy Graham Museum going through a door marked as a cross within the distance, a cross with a verse explaining that it's a cross, in case you didn't get that it's a cross. And then you go into it and it goes dark and then you're in this place and it says, you know, the tomb was rolled and the, and the angels, and then it goes in the distance and as you see in the distance, um, you see a little angel pointing and you go into this room and it's the most famous room on Wheaton's campus, it's called the heaven room. As you walk into the heaven room, the hallelujah chorus is playing as it will be in heaven. It's right there in second opinions, chapter four, verse 11. <laughs> And so I will tell you, um, some people find it hokey. Matter of fact, I would say a lot of young, younger millennials find it hokey. Um, I've wept in the room with Filipino pastors who are doing their master's degree with me. And really, it's fascinating how people respond. I've wept in the room with an older lady who asked me to take her through alone as she had terminal cancer, and we just wept because she stood there, clouds around, glass, reflecting everything, hearing the words, hallelujah. And so that was his focus. And it's a simple focus. And this is the criticism some would make of Mr. Graham. Because we would, we would say the gospel is God, you know, you know, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration, right? I mean, we, we would see the big picture of the cosmic gospel. We would see the individual implications of that gospel. Graham had a singular focus that at times kept him to miss some things. For example, when all the articles came back when he came out when he died, I wrote an article that was prim primarily a hagiography. That's, that was my job as the executive director of the Billy Graham Center. But the managing director of the Billy Graham Center is uh, John Richards, a uh, wonderful uh, teammate for me. He's a, he's a Morehouse man, Howard Law School, Fuller Seminary, doing a PhD now in leadership. And, and he wrote about heroes with clay feet because he's African-American man. And he talked about, you know, people, it was interesting to read the article. Some people, Graham was a, was a pioneer in race relations. Some people, he was absent. And the answer is a little of both because of his singular focus. He did not support, for example, King's March on Washington. Um, but they were friends at times. The, the depth of that friendship may have been exaggerated at times by both for mutual impact, but there was a friendship that was there. He did take down the ropes uh, at Chattanooga in the segregated section, but he preached a whole lot of times before that with the ropes up. And so some might say he was not a pioneer, but he was an early adopter when it cost, and it did cost some things as well. So, but he continued to come back to my primary focus is to preach the gospel. But sometimes there were these strange things like in 1982, the New York Times headline, Billy Graham blends preaching with appeal for peace. He really got involved in, and uh, Bill, Martin, Bill Martin writes some about that, about this in this nuclear disarmament sort of idea. And it was kind of fascinating to watch because he, you know, Ronald Reagan at time, that time was, you know, it was evil empire, it was, uh, and I'll be later, but it was the Soviet Union, we need to battle then and defeat them, and, that Billy, and they have no religious freedom, and then Billy Graham would go do a crusade over there. It was very frustrating for the Republican administration who they would think would have an ally in the story of those things. The, um, when he died, I got an email from both CNN and USA Today to write articles. So let me just share a little bit about what I shared in both of those places in just the few minutes we have left. Um, I said this, I said on CNN, while most articles and memorials portray Graham as a famous Christian or America's pastor, that is not how Graham wanted us to remember him. Graham's true legacy, why so many people are celebrating him, is not that he was famous. Graham's place in American history is due to his singular devotion to making someone else famous. At the heart of his vision was the simple belief that the gospel of Jesus Christ was the needed answer for a struggling world. It's really an odd thing. Graham was world famous for talking about someone else. If you're not a Christian or if you feel you don't feel, know, or feel included in Billy Graham's legacy, please understand that his humanitarian and bridge building work around the globe was inseparable from his belief that salvation was offered to all through Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection. 
Graham would want you to know that he was always striving to show and share the love of Jesus to a broken and hurting world. If you are a Christian, Graham's legacy of evangelism and cultural engagement is yours to maintain. Graham understood what it meant to be a good and faithful servant, and today that baton has been passed. It's up to you to join now that his race has been completed. There's more that I have. I think I'm kind of running out of time. How many minutes do I have left? So in conclusion, Oh, that was really good. You're going to miss that right there. But nope, not for you. <laughs> not for you. So at the funeral, the funeral is fascinating in a whole lot of ways. First of all, who was there? It was a very strange guy. I was there as an attendee, and my brother pulls up in the, um, in the president's motorcade. President Trump was in attendance there. And my brother's the Western District federal prosecutor. So he's just, when a political statement, that's when the president's in town, the, the federal prosecutor for that district goes. So my, I see my brother, and we're seating over there. I see the president get out, and my brother's over there. He's standing by there. We can see each other. And I'm te- but they tell us that if you move, uh, once the president's there, they don't say it, but they're going to shoot you. Um, and so I text my brother, and I'm like, hey, can you see me? He said, yeah, I see. It's like a, I said, come over here. He says, they will shoot me. I said, run fast. And... Uh, <laughs> So my brother and I were at the same global event, 150 yards from each other, and yet could not see one another. But at that funeral, someone, New York Times reporter came up to me, she's a fine reporter, and she said to me, Dr. Stetzer, who's the next Billy Graham? All these people have been asked that question. And there's no one really who claims that mantle, no one in the family claims that mantle. There's some people who would say, like, Luis Palau is the Latino Billy Graham, or whatever. Or some people, someone might say someone else is the Billy Graham. So, the reporter came up to me and said, who's the next Billy Graham? And I smiled and I quickly said, Jane, the Uber driver. And she looked at me and she said, what? And we're friends. And I explained it to her and she said, that's a really great story, but I can't put that in the New York Times. And I said, I know. But I want you to hear as kind of we close today. You remember Jane was the one who slowly and graciously shared the gospel with us on our trip the day before we learned of the death of Mr. Graham. The reality is this, is that if you're here today, somebody shared the gospel with you, and someone shared the gospel with them, and with them, and with them, and it goes all the way back to, it's really a Great Commission highway that goes throughout 2,000 years of history. And I get right now that evangelism has fallen on hard times. I get that you'd want to make it more complex and more robust than perhaps the way that Mr. Graham shared it. But all I'm saying to you is that Great Commission highway came to you. Don't let your life be a cul-de-sac on the Great Commission highway. But I think ultimately, as we talk about Mr. Graham, and we're going to learn history and background and theology, and we're going to learn challenges and struggles and all those things. But at the end of the day, when I walk through the Billy Graham Museum, I'm reminded of the simplicity of the message of the gospel of the cross that changed so much for so many. Yes, I get we live in a much more complex world. And I get that Billy Graham probably wouldn't have been Billy Graham if he lived today in the division that we had. But at the end of the day, someone told him there's a legend, it goes from Moody, to, it, it doesn't, there's no, there's no, it, it falls apart when it goes, you know, the so-and-so told so-and-so, but somebody told Billy Graham, and Jane, the Uber driver, tried to tell me, and my question is, whom will you tell as we celebrate the anniversary of his birth? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you that by your grace and your goodness, you have redeemed us and called us by name. Thank you that the life and legacy of Billy Graham does what the writer of Hebrews exhorted us to do to one another, to provoke one another to love and good deeds. So Father, may you use this symposium to help us to learn academically and robustly and thoughtfully about Billy Graham, but Lord, also provoke our hearts to love and good deeds that men and women need the good news of the gospel. And we ought not to talk about this man without also talking about our neighbor, about the one who came and died and rose again. In Jesus' name, amen.